Wow. Wow. We started late, so we won't even use the song. We'll save that for next week. I want to welcome everybody here. Um, yeah, we're on, we're on old, old Otisville time, aren't we? Um, I want to welcome everybody here. Glad that you, uh, you made it. Um, and hopefully you, were, you didn't show up for class. I mean, thinking you were showing up for class, you're showing up for worship. No, it, never mind, Cliff. I didn't really mean that. Um, let's not forget our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, on our praise list, Mike Guest had successful shoulder surgery. Um, that is good. Carl and Joni are back from Florida. It's good to have them here. Kendra had her surgery Friday, and when she moved from the gurney to her bed in her room, she did. She said that pain in her butt was gone. Um, so, and, I, and I was still in the room. Um, so, oh, my goodness. I feel the love. Uh, Jacob Pace had uh, surgery to remove the tumor from his brain. There are no side effects from that, he, other than a little bit of blurry vision. The doctor said that will clear. Um, he's going home today. Today. So, I mean, that, that was his post. It was his post on the, the ninth. So he said he's going, Sam said on yesterday's post, he's going home today. So that is, that brain surgery on Friday, home on Sunday. How awesome is that? On our travelers list, Swaglers are leaving for Europe to go visit Catherine. Um, they will return on the 30th. Tanners will be going to Ohio and West Virginia. Um, they'll be leaving Thursday and coming back the following Wednesday. Let's not forget on April, the last weekend in April is the UP men's retreat. Um, don't forget ladies had their craft day on Thursday and next week is the painting class. On, uh, so sign up list is Back up on the thing, lunch is provided. Uh, please remember those that are shut in. Uh, Marion Belson is still not necessarily improved. She has good days and then she has um, days that are not so good. Um, we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Haiti. You know, usually we talk about the Emmaus house, but this is everywhere in Haiti. Uh, things are not getting better. Gangs have overtaken the capital. Um, the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic has been closed. Tom just informed me this morning that they, in the embassy they have moved some of the, they have airlifted some of the people out of the U.S. embassy, and they have Marines on the ground to protect those that are staying. So things are very, very not good there. So uh, please pray for them. On our uh, prayer list, um, Mike is not here. They're having problems with his blood pressure. Successful shoulder, but they're having problems with his blood pressure. It's really low. And if it goes much lower, they're going to have to take him um, to, the, to the ER. Um, Tracy Perry's very good friend. We talked about Hope Helton last week with a massive heart attack. Um, there's an update from her husband. I sent it out in an email because it's real long. Tracy sent it to me, so read that email. Um, it's, there's quite a, quite, a, quite a few things there that, um, we need, that she needs prayer for. Laura, Laura had her consult at the U of M Friday and is scheduled for an MRI. I think it's the 25th, um, and then they're going to discuss a, about removal for that. Sarah July has a mass on her back uh, that's concerning to them. She's going to see the doctor Tuesday. Uh, Kendra is not here because she's very sore, but here's the interesting part. She's not sore on her back, she's sore on her front. She said her neck, her chest, her ribs, and her stomach, and I think it's from laying an hour and a half on her stomach, um, is, is what's giving her some issues. Um, Tess, brothers, uh, Tess and Terry's brother, um, Tim and Ed Spawn, uh, Tim, or as a lot of us know him, Ed Spawn's having extensive and intricate back surgery in April. Also, Terry, or Tess is not here, she has that eczema on her face that's so bad that it's actually bleeding. So um, she needs our prayers. I know you guys are going to be surprised about this, but I made a mistake on a date. Um, Garrett Taylor didn't have brain surgery on Friday. It's tomorrow. Um, doctors will insert that rod into the tumor, treat it, uh, hoping to kill it so that there won't be any ra radiation or surgery to remove it. Uh, we talked about Jake, so... Um, Please continue to pray for him. This Saturday, we've, we've mentioned in the past about um, 
Mallory Garrett. Um, her funeral will be Friday, or this coming Saturday, visitation starting at 10. It'll be at the, at the Lapeer Church of Christ. Um, desserts, if you have them here Friday night, we will make sure that they get to, where, to, um, to the dinner. And also, we mentioned last week that Gary Turner had passed away. Many of us that are older know him. He was very, very, very involved in starting with Valley Christian Academy, sang with the Chansonniers, lots of things. He uh, passed away, and there will be a memorial for him next Monday at the Bristol Road Church of Christ at 1030. Let's give our attention to Mark as we start out in song. Let's worship God in song. All things praise thee. All things praise thee, Lord most high, heaven and earth and sea and sky. All were for thy glory. I'll be reading Zechariah 10, 3 through 6. My anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord Almighty will care for his flock, the people of Judah, and make, and make them proud, and make them like a proud horse in battle. From Judah will come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler. Together they will be like warriors in battle, trampling their enemy into the mud of the streets. They will fight because the Lord is with them, and they will put the enemy horsemen to shame. I will strengthen Judah and save the tribes of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. They will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Let us pray. Almighty 
Glorious and blessed God, we, we come before you this morning and thank you for this wonderful day. Another day given to us to enjoy your beauty and your majesty. We are so thankful, Father, of your kindness and your ability to listen to our words as we talk to you in prayer. We thank you, Father, for the words you have put before us in your book, words to encourage us to do what is right and to live a life that is pleasing to you. Dear Father, we are so blessed to be able to sing praises to your name, to study your word this morning. Father, we know the there's a long list of members of this church who are in need of prayer. And we want to especially thank you, Father, for the answer of the prayers for Mike Guest and Jacob Pace and Kendra Ray. And also that in the coming weeks with Garrett Taylor and Carol Davis as they undergo surgeries. We are so thankful that we can come to you and talk to you and on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Father, we ask your blessing on Nathan and his family. We are so thankful, Lord, that you have brought them to our midst and that Nathan continues to bring us and teach us the good news. And most of all, Father, thank you for sacrificing your son on the cross Amen. to redeem us, to take away our sins who died for us, that we as believers may someday live with you forever and ever. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen.
you may or may not have noticed, uh, but this year is an election year. Um, you can tell it's an election year because during family gatherings, most people will tiptoe around um, hot, topic, hot topic discussions or avoid them altogether. Um, you can also tell because the media is in full force trying to convince you that they and their team is telling the truth about a particular subject matter, that they have all the answers and the solutions to everything. The other side is saying the same thing, just totally opposite of their opposition. CNN, MSNBC, Fox, or whatever media outlet is just constantly spewing bad news about the side that they don't agree with or the side that they don't represent. Whatever truth they decide to feed you is almost always a smidgen of truth wrapped in a lie, which really makes the whole thing just lies upon lies and the story continues to change year after year. Well, today we're gonna to talk about the truth. Not truth wrapped in a lie that changes with the seasons. We're gonna talk about real truth. Truth that has been there since the beginning. I'm, gonna, I'm going to read Romans 3, 21 through 26, and forgive me if I get tongue-tied on this. I kept tripping over my own tongue reading this this morning, so just bear with me. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law of the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith, he did this to demonstrate his righteous, righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just as the one who justifies those who have, been, who have, those who have faith in Christ. We're all sinners. The Son of God was tortured and sacrificed so that we may be saved. There is no better story, and it is the truth. So right now, let's all focus on the one thing that really matters, and that's Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made for us. Let's pray over the bread. God, our Father in heaven, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who was tortured and sacrificed so that we can have salvation. We take this bread in remembrance of him, and I pray that we do so in a manner that is worthy of you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray over the cup. God, I pray that we all stay focused on Christ as we drink from this cup. That we remember that, that it is through his sacrifice that we are saved. Please be with us now as we drink. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. This time I want to dismiss the children. <clears throat> and before the lesson, we'll sing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him of all ye heavenly hold. Praise Father, Son, and
Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody was so happy to wake up with the snowy surprise and one hour less sleep. We're still ready to go, though. I think one of the hardest jobs that uh, is underrepresented, underappreciated, the most important job in the world, in my opinion, because it deals with the most important thing in the world, is being an elder. Elders do much more than many people realize. They are in the weeds almost every single day trying to keep peace, stick with the truth, and because of that, sometimes people get upset. Because of that, some, sometimes people leave, even though they're doing the very, very best job that they can, which, if we're being honest, we couldn't do. <laughs> I, I thought about my future. What, what's going to happen when I get older? I, I want to preach until the day I die. I want to die preaching. That would be wonderful, to be honest. I want to die right after I say amen. But uh, I think about my future, and I think about the prospects of me being an elder one day. And right now, at this point in my life, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I want to because of the immense responsibility that is there. Hard decision-making skills uh, in, into levels that we just, we just don't consider a, a lot of the time. Let me give you an example. There was a church that I knew of um, down south. And this church had a convicted pedophile who wanted to be a member there. He was totally repentant, it seemed, totally uh, in mourn over his own sin. And this guy went to the elders and said, Hey, this is my backstory. This is the things that I've done. But I've repented of that. I've put my trust in Jesus. I've been baptized. I, I want to follow God and I want to attend church. Is, is that something that your church would allow me to do? And the elders thought about it. And they had to make, whichever they chose, they had to make a seemingly impossible decision. Some people were upset about it. Other people completely agreed. What they, what they ended up choosing was that, okay, we will let you attend. Because what are they going to do? Bar them from worshiping God? That's the hard decision. But they made a compromise. You know, because life itself has consequences. Even though God has forgiven you because of Jesus, there are still real-life consequences that we have to deal with. Uh, just think of Moses and Aaron. They're forgiven. We're going to see them one day. But they had real-life consequences they had to deal with. So the compromise was this. Here's what it's going to take. We're going to have... Two of our members here, I believe they were deacons, I could be wrong. We're going to have two of our members here um, who are armed escort you around the building. You will come in the door, you will be met by your brothers in Christ, and they will stay with you wherever you go, even if you're going to the bathroom. You will go to your pew, you'll sit there, we'll worship God together, and that's the way that it's going to be. Now, whether you end up agreeing with that or not, you know, that's not the point of the conversation. The point is, could you make a decision like that? That is very, very difficult. Whichever way you go. And like I said, you know, what, if you believe that's wrong or right, that's not the point of it. The point is that elders have an incredibly hard job. And sometimes we just don't appreciate that enough. And it's because of their extremely hard job that God is so very angry at shepherds when they do not lead the way that they are supposed to lead. If you would go ahead and open up your books, your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 10. Zechariah chapter 10. We covered this 
uh, last, whenever we covered Zechariah, I, I can't remember. I think it was two weeks ago. In Zechariah, the first two verses are, it's, it's about God pleading with them. When, when, when you want the spring rain, pray to me. Don't go to these other gods that can't do anything for you. Don't go to these fake deities who can't speak, who can't hear, who can't walk for themselves. And then he gives the group that's responsible for letting this happen. And it's the shepherds. Read with me in verse 3. My anger is hot against the shepherds. And I will punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah. And will make them like his majestic steed in, in battle. If you look at... Uh, all, of, all over the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, there's always shepherd language going on. Always shepherd language. What's, what's the most famous psalm you know, when it comes to shepherding? Psalm 23, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. Other times, other psalms, other passages, he's the shepherd, and we are what? Sheep. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about why that is? Why are we called sheep? Why aren't we called like like lions. Why aren't we called wolves? Why aren't we called, I don't know, give me a cool animal, a brontosaurus or something like that. Why aren't we called something cool? Because he's making a very pointed illustration when he calls shepherds and sheep what, what he calls them. You know, sheep themselves are, man, they are funny animals. They really are. Have you ever paid attention to how a sheep acts? There's this one video, I love this video so much, where this, this little lamb is stuck in the crack in, a ground, in the ground, okay? And I, I'm assuming the guy's the shepherd. He comes over to the sheep, he pulls him by the leg, gets him out of the, the opening of the ground, and this thing hops and skips along and then goes right back into it again. Sheep are dumb animals, but man, are they funny. Sheep themselves, it is very clear, at least to me, they need a shepherd. God designed sheep to be herded by a shepherd. Uh, if a sheep rolls over on its back when its fur is too big, wool, 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 sorry, when its wool is too big, they won't be able to roll back over again. The gases, two, one of two things will happen. The gases in their stomach will either build up and build up until they die because they can't roll back over by themselves, or will their bellies exposed to predators of the air or wolves that come around and just eat them. They're dead. Without a shepherd, you know, the, the problem of having too much wool, it will grow over their eyes. So that they cannot see. They, can't, they don't know where they're going anymore. They don't have a shepherd to roll them back over. They don't have a shepherd to cut the wool. They're going to die. They'll wander right off a, a cliff without a shepherd. Sheep will just wander. They'll go and they'll go and then they'll get in trouble and they'll, they'll die. They'll get eaten by something or like I said, they'll wander off of a cliff. God chose sheep for a very, very good reason. Because sheep are dumb. They really are. Now, the, uh, like, like an atheist, perhaps, will hear that illustration of the people of God being sheep, and they'll, they'll get really, really offended. I'm not dumb. I'm very smart. I was top of my class. Or, if you're a Christian, you'll, you'll see the illustration of us being sheep. You'll realize what it means, and you'll go, yeah, I agree with all of that. I'm all of that. I make so many mistakes all the time. Sheep need 
shepherds. They need someone to guide them. It says in verse verse, uh, 2, go back a verse. For the household gods utter nonsense. The diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. Who was supposed to be the shepherds? The religious leaders of Israel. Also the king. They didn't have a king at that time. They had priests. They had some scribes. And that's about it. They had a governor, Zerubbabel. But that's really about it. These sheep, or these shepherds, in this time, in Zechariah's time, were not doing their job. And it seems like in the Old Testament, that like happens all of the time. God is always, always angry at the shepherds because they don't do their job. The people of God are called sheep because they need to be protected from a whole lot of things. And when they don't protect the sheep, God gets angry. Sometimes he gives his wrath. Sometimes he judges. He said in Ezekiel 34, 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? Even in Jesus' time, God gave strong rebukes to the shepherds, the religious elite who were supposed to guide and teach the way of God to the people, and they didn't. There's that whole passage, a wonderful passage, scary passage in Matthew 23, where Jesus says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, seven times. Just rips them apart because they were not doing their jobs. You know, eventually, God got tired of this. He got tired of this in the Old Testament times. He got tired of always relying on these shepherds who would not do their job, not guide their sheep. And so he says, fine, I'll do it. Ezekiel 34, 10 through 11. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their, uh, their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. He's giving a prophecy. I will become my people's shepherd. I will do that. And we know that he did do that. What is Jesus called in the New Testament? The good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And he does a shepherding in many ways. The Lord Jesus Christ is shepherding his church even now. Even though, of course, we can't see it. We can't see it happening. But he shepherds his church even now. One of two ways. Well, both ways. Major ways, in my opinion. First of all, through the Holy Spirit that's in, the, in every single believer. Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit strengthens, guides. He produces fruit in your life. That is how Jesus shepherds his flock. Through the Holy Spirit that is in every single Christian. A continual comfort. But of course, Jesus also shepherds his sheep by appointing other shepherds. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all things that he might fulfill all things. This is talking about Jesus in the context. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
The elders of the church even today have a lot on their plate. I want you to do, do, a, little, do a little study for yourself sometime. I want you to go through the New Testament, and I want you to look at all of the qualifications, expectations of what is required of a shepherd in the Lord's church. What is required of an elder? You're going to find a lot of stuff that's all under their belt that they have to see to. I have just a few things listed here. First of all, protect against false teaching. False teaching, of course, is everywhere today. It wasn't any different in the first century when you had the Gnostics who were, de- who were saying all sorts of wicked, evil stuff about Jesus, how he wasn't God, how he didn't really die on the cross, how it looked like he died on the cross, but that was really just his ghost. And then sometime later there was a story about the cross talking. I don't know. False teachers are around today. They've been around the past 100 years, the past 2,000 years, all the way back into Zechariah's time. Of course, we can see false teachers around on TV. Just, just turn on the TV to some popular Christian channel, and you'll find, you'll find all sorts of false teaching. I remember one of the things that I wrote in my letter of why I want to become a preacher that I had to submit to the school before I went. Uh, one of the things that I wrote is that I saw a video. I saw a video of a bunch of prosperity stuff that got shipped over to another country. Yeah, that comes from America. We're responsible for that. Um, And he convinced, this pastor convinced his congregation to drink gasoline and said, God will heal you. What happened? It wasn't good. There's tons of false teaching that's out there. There's tons of churches that... Don't do what we and other churches try to do. Start with this. Not your feelings, not your gut, not your best intention. This, the word of God. The elders have to fight against false teaching. They have to be on alert. Because good intentioned Christians will hear something and they'll think it's true. And they'll be carried away in a lie. And they'll have to pay the price for that. I'm not talking about, you know, little things that don't matter. I'm talking about big things, things that change the gospel, things that change the deity of Christ, Trinity, stuff like that. Main things. They have to watch out for false teaching. They have to see to the spiritual benefit of the souls that they are shepherding over. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine making sure everybody is okay spiritually? If somebody starts to wander, have to get you know, closer to them and say, hey, what's, what's going on? Can you imagine how many uncomfortable conversations an elder must have simply out of the love that they have for the people that they're shepherding? What else do they do? Of course, this is obvious. Speak the truth. I love it when we, whenever we get to hear our our elders come up front, speak, teach. Uh, Tom did a class on Hebrews, I think. It was a while ago. It was pretty good. They are the example to us of what solid biblical Christianity looks like. When they get up there and they preach, or sometimes when, uh, when they teach, sometimes when they preach, you get to see that. You get to see them in action. You get to see them standing for the truth. When they get to lead the Lord's Supper table, When they get to pray for us. Can you imagine the weight? I can't. I can't. That's why, you know, I don't know if I want to be an elder in the future. But if no one steps up at that time, I'm going to have to make a hard decision. All of that and much, much more. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't say one of my favorite ones. The settled disputes. Do you remember a long time ago when I told you there was a church out in Colorado who wanted to split because 
one side of the church spelled hallelujah with an H or a Y or a J and the other side spelled it differently. Can you imagine having to deal with that kind of petty thing? We've got bigger stuff going on in the church, different, bigger battles on the outside. And they got to sit and deal with that. That's enough to make you grow gray hair in just like two days. But they do that. Why? Because they love the sheep. Because they're tasked by the good shepherd to do a good job. And looking back in Old Testament history, especially in Zechariah's time, that is why God is so upset with the shepherds all the time. Because, yeah, they've got a lot on their plate. There's a lot that's expected of them. They've, they've got a lot going on. He says, my anger, verse 3, Zechariah 10, verse 3, my anger is hot against the shepherds. I will punish the leaders. Now, this word leaders here, it's a very interesting word. Um, we don't really know if it refers to, you know, the religious leaders or if it's the royal leaders making big decisions for Israel or if it's both. Either way, yeah, it's, it's he goats in Hebrew, which I think is funny. He's going to punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. You probably have heard a whole lot of funny stories, maybe half of them from Terry Pace, about elders. He's told me some really wild stories about things that elders have done at other churches he's been to. Some really silly stuff. I remember there was this one elder. I'm not going to say where because I don't want to get in trouble. But there was this one elder um, that was appointed to a church with another group of elders. And he got upset because the, the preacher at that church quoted C.S. Lewis, got angry, and then resigned. Is that like a quality of a good elder? To be that, you know, upset over little things? Uh, uh, let me give you another one. Very good preacher friend of mine. I'm not going to say who. He was at a congregation. It was his first work. I'm grateful to God that this did not happen to me with my first work. But he was at a congregation, and the elders really did not like him for unreasonable things. And it just kept boiling and boiling and building and building all the tension there underlying. And one day, they were in some sort of congregational meeting in, in the auditorium, and the preacher was trying to step out of the row, and he stepped just over too much and... and fell onto him as the elder was standing up. And so the elder pounced on him, took him down to the floor and started choking him. Is that, the, is, is that what you want from an elder? No. There are good elders out there. There are bad elders out there. There's some really funny elders too. The reason why... They get judged so harshly by God in Scripture is because they watch out for every single soul. You know, our elders, they probably pray for all of us every single day, probably three times a day. I don't know. I can't imagine that wait. They do a good job. Am I going to get a cookie for this later? Maybe. Maybe. Checks in, checks in the mail. Yeah. Our elders do a good job. I am proud and honored to serve under the kinds of men that we have leading, shepherding this congregation. I can't imagine another first work for me. This is, it really is just fantastic. These elders, in Zachariah's time, these shepherds, not doing it. They were leading the people away into idolatry. They did not care about the sheep of Yahweh. They did not care about their spiritual well-being, where they were going when they died. 
They didn't care about, well, what I teach is probably going to send somebody to hell. Who cares? They didn't think about that. They fed themselves. In fact, God says that a lot in the Old Testament. They only cared about themselves. Only cared about feeding themselves. Physically feeding themselves. Getting money from the people. And that's about it. That's why God is so angry. Because of their weak decisions. Their cowardly decisions. To not stay with the word of God. And stay obedient to him. They are willingly letting souls go to hell. That's a shame. And that's why they get judged so harshly. My anger is hot against the shepherds. I will punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and I will make them like his majestic steed. I want to cover verse 4 before we end. This verse is very, very cool in my opinion. Because it's another way of God saying, I'm going to shepherd them then. You won't do your job. I will shepherd my people. I'll tend them. I'll take care of them. I'll love them. I'll teach them. I'll guide them. It says from him. Him who? God in the context. Yahweh in the context. From him shall come the cornerstone. The tent peg. From him the battle bow. From him every ruler, all of them together. Now, I'm going to save you a whole lot of research and study. Maybe If you want more information, please let me give it to you later. Um, this, the way that the Hebrew is set up seems to be implying individuals converging into one. That's as simple as I can make that statement right now. Uh, we don't know if this is a dual prophecy. Like there was going to be a leader who would be identified as a cornerstone, an intent peg, and a battle bow. Um, we don't know. But the Hebrew does make it obvious by what verbs it's using that all of these converge into one. The cornerstone. What's a cornerstone? It is literally the stone that is first placed in order to give a, a proper beginning foundation for a building, a house. It's the first stone you put down. And this leader is going to be called the cornerstone. We know who that refers to. That refers to Jesus. There's a prophecy in Psalm 118, verse 22. It says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, fulfilled in Matthew 21, 42. What about the tent peg? What a name, the tent peg. Well, what does a tent peg do? Well, we have a... We have a little tent in our, in our yard. It's a little outdoor tent. It's open on one side completely. And, you know, the kids like to play in it every once in a while. And whenever we get a high wind, I'd have to go and drag it out of the woods. Why? Because I was lazy. I didn't put the tent pegs in the ground. The tent pegs hold it together. They give stability to, to the tent. And so this tent peg is going to come. And it's referred to as Jesus in Isaiah 22, verse 23. I will fasten him, contacts the Messiah, like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. What else? The battle bow. The battle bow. That's basically military strength. Strength. That's what it is. Now, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he set up his church, he said, my kingdom's not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight for me. We're not going out and we're, you know, converting by the sword like Islam. We don't do that. We do that by changing hearts and minds. That's the way that Jesus runs his kingdom. But it does not mean that it is not violent. Yeah, I said that. It does get violent, especially in the spiritual realm. Jason did a class in the teen uh, room this morning talking about the spiritual warfare that's going behind everything. And the spiritual warfare that went on behind the cross is nothing but righteous violence. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 says, He, being Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. 
We also have the prophecy, well, not a prophecy, but Paul saying what's going to happen in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Jesus must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. This is all military. This is all strength. And, of course, we can't forget how he's depicted in Revelation 19, 11, which I conveniently have embossed on my grip Revelation, uh, for my 1911, Revelation 1911. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. God is promising a shepherd that will come in Zechariah, who will be called the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, everything that that represents. And he came. He is here. The good shepherd is here. He lives. He is the cornerstone. He is the tent peg. He gives stability to the church. He gives stability to the entire world, believe it or not, because nothing happens here without his say-so. He's also the battle bow. He is waging war in the background. Don't you ever forget that. Why? Because he's a good shepherd. What did it say about David? What did he do when he was a shepherd? He killed lions. I think bears too. Maybe tigers, oh my. I don't know. He's a good shepherd. And our shepherd is the best shepherd. He takes care of all of us. And he appoints the shepherds over the church here. And our elders do a good job. This morning, I want you to know that the good shepherd, the eternal shepherd, loves you. Because that's what he does. He loves his sheep. I want you to know that there's nothing that you can do to lose his forgiveness. There's nothing he can't forgive. If you're a Christian and you've forgotten that simple fundamental truth, Jesus will forgive you. We'd love to pray for you. If you're not a Christian, you can get to know this good shepherd who died for his sheep, died for the sins of his people, for your sins to be forgiven. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent and be baptized. We'd love to do that for you. If there's anything you need this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand and as we sing.
Any other announcements? Yes, sir. Sherry will be here this Friday between 3.30 and 4 to pick up any desserts to take over to uh, the church church on Saturday. So if you want to bring, she will be here at the building at between 3.30 and 4 this Friday. There you go. Oh, you got a thing. Do your thing. I should have done this earlier. Sorry about that. My man brain. Um, well, we have another winner. Somebody who's filled out all the sermon sheets. Josie. All right. Good job. Very good job. Do you want, do you want me to? Okay. All right. Collection plates are up here. Uh, let's pray. God, our Holy Father in heaven, you've given us so much. And I pray that you would guide us to give generously and cheerfully to causes that spread your word and your glory. God, be with us as we travel out in this snowy weather again, and be with us as we take on this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.